Israel's genocidal onslaught against Gaza hasn't gone away. Quite the opposite. The evidence suggests it has, in fact, escalated. Now, we'll be discussing that in videos to come. But first, we've got to focus on a truly hideous article in The Lancet. It really does deserve uh, urgent attention. We have to talk about this. The media has always failed to reflect the horror of the butchery of Gaza and has, in fact, repeatedly legitimised Israel's war crimes. But that existing failure has only deepened. It's been nine months. They've undoubtedly claimed at the top of media organisations that fatigue is setting in. There has, of course, been the UK general elections. There's been Joe Biden's public implosion, the French elections. We could go on. There's a lot to deflect attention from one of the great crimes of our age, which has Western fingerprints all over it. Now, the piece we're discussing was submitted to The Lancet by three prominent health academics. And it suggests a death toll in Gaza, that is the number of Palestinians killed by Israel's military onslaught, let's not be euphemistic, that's what we're talking about, is much, much higher than the official figures suggest. Now, the official figures have themselves been subjected to a vicious campaign of atrocity denial, even though they have been proven accurate after previous Israeli attacks, that after the first few weeks, the personal details and Israel-assigned IDs of each victim were released, the United Nations and multiple NGOs have defended these figures as credible. The US has done the same. Israeli military sources have privately leaked that they similarly believe these figures to be credible. The official figures exclude those buried under the rubble, many thousands. The reporting system has been trashed because of the destruction of Gaza's hospitals and Gaza's infrastructure. Indeed, we've not even discussed those with serious health conditions. The many Gazans who had cancer, serious health conditions... Uh, heart conditions not treated uh, since this genocidal onslaught began. We could go on. That's the problem. Well, this piece of The Lancet really underlines a very important point, that in such violent onslaughts, the vast majority of those killed are not directly killed by missiles, bombs and bullets, which is what the official figures are talking about. The article notes that by the 19th of June 2024, 37,396 Palestinians were officially registered as killed in the Gaza Strip, according to its health ministry. They note, too, the numbers of deaths amongst, say, those working for UNRWA. That is the United Nations Agency for Palestinian Refugees. It's the main humanitarian agency in Gaza. It has suffered the worst death toll of the United Nations ever in such a short space of time since it was founded. That is illustrative of the wider death toll, because if you can look at the proportion of a specific cohort of people being killed, that gives you pointers as to the overall credibility of the death figures. Now, they note the difficulties of identifying the dead in the current, frankly, apocalyptic conditions in Gaza. The Lancet article notes the number of reported deaths is likely an underestimate. The NGO Air Wars, for example, as they say, undertakes detailed assessments of incidents in Gaza, and they find that not all the names of victims who can be identified are included in the Ministry of Health's official list. They also know estimates that the number of bodies under the rubble is likely substantial. That is possibly more than 10,000 buried under the rubble. They're not included in the official death statistics. They're classed as missing. Let me just read from this piece. Armed conflicts have indirect health implications beyond the direct harm from violence. Even if the conflict ends immediately, there will continue to be many indirect deaths in the coming months and years from causes such as reproductive, communicable and non-communicable diseases. The death toll is expected to be large given the intensity of the conflict, destroyed healthcare infrastructure, severe shortages of food, water and shelter, the population's inability to flee to safe places and the loss of funding to UNRWA, one of the very few humanitarian organisations still active in the Gaza Strip. Extremely important points there. I mean, the destruction of the healthcare system alone imposes a daily death sentence on Palestinians, and that will continue to mean more deaths for a very, very long time. Every single hospital has been attacked to the point of no longer being functioning in a way that you or I would understand. And that means what we discuss often a clinical term in such situations we have to focus on excess deaths so that is you look at the death rate in the years before a particular event happens a pandemic or in this case a military onslaught and you look at the increase in deaths over and above the pre-existing trend and that is the only really reliable way of looking at the overall death toll because then you're looking at for example, 
those directly killed because of the violence, but you're also including, say, cancer patients who aren't getting the treatment they need and who may well go on to die when they shouldn't have done, for example, in a year or two after this particular phase ends. Now, let me go on. Let me read from this further. This part really is crucial and chilling. In recent conflicts, such indirect deaths range from three to 15 times the number of direct deaths. Applying a conservative estimate of four indirect deaths per one direct death to the 37,396 deaths reported, it is not implausible to estimate that up to 186,000 or even more deaths could be attributable to the current conflicts in Gaza using the 2022 Gaza Strip population estimate of 2.3 or 2,375,259 people. This would translate to 7.9% of the total population of the Gaza Strip. A report from February 7th, 2024, at the time when the direct death toll was 28,000, estimated that without a ceasefire, there would be between 58,000, 260 deaths without an epidemic or escalation, and 85,750 deaths if both occurred by August the 6th, 2024. 186,000 Palestinians plausibly be killed using a conservative estimate. That would be nearly 8%, as they know, of Gaza's population, but they also say it could be even higher than that. They go on to say, of course, that an immediate urgency as far as needed, as well as measures to ensure the distribution of medical supplies, food, clean water, other resources for basic human needs. But they also say it's crucial we record the scale and the nature of suffering for the sake of accountability. That's crucial, of course, given the pending requests from the International Criminal Court's chief prosecutor for arrest warrants for Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and his defence minister Yov Gallant for war crimes and crimes against humanity, as well as the case brought by South Africa against Israel and the International Court of Justice alleging genocide. Now, a few points here. It's really important to emphasise how in other conflicts, and I use conflict sparingly here, given it is a genocidal onslaught by a military superpower, but in other conflicts, most deaths are not directly caused by violence. Let's consider Yemen, for example. The United Nations Humanitarian Office in 2020 believed that the war had killed 233,000 people but they believed 131,000 of those deaths had indirect causes, like lack of food, health, services and infrastructure. It should also be noted that the war was not asymmetrical in the way that this is. That is, there are multiple armed groups in Yemen with strong military positions, rather than military superpower unleashing apocalyptic firepower, a strip of land no bigger than East London in size. This is important to state because... There are those who try to minimise and cheerlead Israel's genocidal onslaught by playing a truly sadistic game of what about me. That is, why are you talking about the horror in Gaza rather than, say, Yemen? Now, it should be said, I've written more about Yemen, more newspaper columns about Yemen and that war than any other newspaper columns in Britain. I've been writing about Yemen for years. I filmed a documentary in a Yemeni refugee camp back in 2016. I actually care about Yemen. I care about that horror. I care about Western complicity in those deaths. I'm not looking at Yemen for the first time as a convenient stick to pick up, to beat those who oppose the mass slaughter of the Palestinian people. I'm not using the mass slaughter of innocent Yemenis to devalue the lives of Palestinians who are being butchered in huge numbers, which is what we've seen some of the most cynical, disgusting people on earth do. And fuck them. The Western-backed and armed Saudi-led coalition is believed to be responsible specifically for 15,000 civilian deaths. Now, on its own terms, all of this is hideous. It is not to belittle the horror of Yemen, to emphasise just how much worse the horror of Gaza is. As I've said, what exists in Yemen on its own terms is truly horrific. And that just merely underlines just how horrific Gaza is. You see, the population of Yemen is well over 33 million, compared to what was it what was around 2.3 million in Gaza. The proportion of Gaza's population slaughtered is much, much higher than Yemen, however you cut it. And indeed, the deaths we're talking about in Yemen took place over many years, while in Gaza we're talking about nine months. So a much higher proportion of deaths in a much shorter space of time. Indeed, what the Lancet is telling us is that Gaza's absolute death toll, the absolute numbers of those killed, may now be comparable to the absolute numbers in Yemen, even though the population of Gaza is about 15 times smaller and the time frame is much, much shorter. You actually have to go elsewhere to look for comparable levels of horror, and by that I mean some of the worst crimes in human history. Let's look, for example, at the reign of Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, whose hideous tyranny ruled for about four years in the 1970s before the Vietnamese army 
overthrew them. Now, it's estimated that around a fifth of the population of Cambodia was killed over the space of those four years. That is around 20% of the population. A truly monstrous crime of human, of historic proportions. I think we all agree on that. What The Lancet is discussing here is based on a conservative estimate. 8% in a much shorter space of time. So we're talking potentially about what? Approaching half of the Khmer Rouge slaughter as a proportion of the population, which took place over four years in a much shorter space of time. That's what we're talking about at the moment. Now, it must be repeated over and over and over again. And I hate to say this, because it's a horrible thing to say, isn't it? But many more are going to be killed in Gaza. We don't know how many. From those directly killed, from bombs, missiles, bullets, to those who will starve, those who are denied clean water, those with cancer, heart problems, or other serious untreated conditions, pregnant women denied the medical care that they need, as well as newborn babies, the general overall stresses imposed on the human body by living huge periods of time without proper shelter, without the needs of life being satisfied. We have to be honest. This is like many pointed out, like if you just think about famine, that if you immediately just flooded the place as best you could, there was no, there was a total ceasefire and you just flooded the place with aid, you would still have people starving to death for a long period of time. It's like a runaway train, you press the brakes, it takes a long time for it to come to a halt. Now, clearly, we are discussing one of the worst crimes of our age, and those who support this obscenity must be damned, but so too must those who are silent. What were you thinking? What were you thinking? You didn't actually have an excuse, did you? I mentioned Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge, and there were some suckers at the time who de 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 denied reality, and they were gullible idiots. They weren't, on a daily basis, being live-streamed to genocide on their computers, were they? Like, no, very few crimes have been so thoroughly and overwhelmingly documented as this one. Thanks to the Palestinian journalists in Gaza who have suffered the worst slaughter of journalists ever recorded in human history in such a short space of time, often slaughtered alongside their families. Thanks to social media, thanks to cameras on people's phones, we have seen at least some of the crimes that have been committed. Not most of them, but enough, enough to know some of the worst crimes of our age have been committed. There was never an excuse. You only had to listen to not just that evidence, what all these NGOs were saying, what the United Nations were saying, what multiple foreign governments were saying, the fact that there's a genocide case at the International Court of Justice, the fact that the Chief Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court has requested arrest warrants against the Prime Minister and the Defence Minister, with likely far more charges to come against far more people. What were you thinking? What were you thinking? You see, I, 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 those who still support this, I've said this before, but, you know, I just think they're so too disgusting to even often think about anymore. I mean, they're just depraved freaks. It's those who are silent except for the hand-wringing. Despite all the evidence. What's your excuse? Cowardice? You were scared? Thought people would yell at you? Thought your career might be compromised? I've said this before as well. It is people like you who are responsible for some of the worst crimes in human history. I said people like you. The people who stayed silent throughout history when horrors were taking place, if they hadn't been silent, they would have stopped those horrors. It's not just the people who directly support these things who are to blame. It's not just the loudly, you know, those loudly apologising and cheerleading horror and denying horror who have blood on their hands. It's the people who knew what was going on or who knew enough of what was going on, but did nothing to fight it or to speak out, they're the ones who are at least as responsible for the great horrors of our past and, as we can see, our present. And I'll never stop being angry with them. None of, and this is not about me, this is all of us. None of us should stop being angry with these people. This is what they've done. Look at what they're doing. They're still not speaking out, a lot of them. A lot of them have just gone completely silent, not even bothering to hand ring anymore. Occasionally, it's like, oh, it's so terrible, it's so sad. No discussion of the crimes being committed by the Israeli state with direct support of our governments. The media organisations who have failed from the start to frame this 
on the terms of what was actually happening, including based on the most overt declarations of intent, pretty much of any atrocity in history. They just loudly went out and told us all what they were going to do. And often those statements by Israeli leaders and officials weren't even reported in Western media outlets, let alone used to frame the reporting of what was happening. Yeah, well, they can't get away with this. And we have to speak out um, ever loudly, and we can't let them just move on because the Israeli slaughter isn't moving on. And we'll talk about them in the coming videos. There's more of the reports that are now coming out. Just, you know, from soldiers, Israeli soldiers who are now leaking the crimes that they committed. And we've got a video about this from uh, an Israeli uh, Palestinian media organization called 972 Mag, who have already reported on what's going on. Well, silent during a genocide. Those people, I bet the people who, the, the, I'm, I'm just going to keep going on about this a little bit. People, are, these are the people, they'd look back at history and see those people as disgusting as well. They'd, they'd see that those people are disgusting in the past. They go, how could people not speak out? What were they thinking? Well, now you know, you are those people. That's you. And you should, you should feel that guilt and that shame for the rest of your life. For the rest of your life, you should think about right now the screams of horror up and down what remains of the Gaza Strip as I speak. The screams of anguish, the screams of pain. Right now, people choking to death, people suffocating under, under rubble, including little kids, people being burned to death. It's happening every day. It's happening now. It's happening as you listen to me. And you're still fucking silence with you people, honestly. We have to escalate our campaigns in support of boycott, investment and sanctions, dismantling Israeli apartheid and occupation and securing a just peace based on equality for Palestinians and Jewish citizens, that the land belongs to all on the basis of equality. And we can't stop fighting for that. Never let the horrors of this world degrade your own humanity. Please like and subscribe. Do leave your thoughts, your comments. Love to hear as ever. We're not going to stop speaking about this. The UK election has now ended. I, obviously, we tried to keep up uh, coverage of Palestine and Gaza throughout. We're not going to let this go. That's my promise to you. We're not going to let this go. We're going to keep talking about it. We're going to keep interviewing people. We're going to keep talking about the horrors and the atrocities. We're going to keep talking about our, the complicity of our, of our governments, of our media organisations. We're not going to stop. We're going to make sure we use this platform to speak the truth. That's the point of having a platform. What is the point of having a platform like the one I have unless you use it for that purpose? Literally zero. So that's my promise. That's our promise to you. Please like and subscribe. Do leave your thoughts, your comments. Um, help us keep the show on the road at page.com forward slash under84. Uh, listen to the podcast. I'll speak to you soon.